Thank you for that lovely introduction. And I share the ambivalence. Um, I think when we, we who write books, and there are many in this audience I know who do, uh, you always want your book to be relevant. You want it to come out at a time when people are interested in the topic. I wouldn't have been sad if my book had been a little less relevant. Uh, in fact, in the introduction to the book, um, I write, uh, I talk about how difficult this book was to write, and I was troubled. I couldn't figure out why it was so difficult. I had a hard time putting my head around the topic and shaping it and writing it and sticking with it. And then I realized, because I said, it, it shouldn't be hard. I've been writing on the topic of the Holocaust, anti-Semitism, Holocaust denial for many, many years. Why should this, Manishtana in the spirit, why should this book be any different from the others in the spirit of the Passover, which has just passed? And then it dawned on me. Uh, when I write about the Holocaust, even about Holocaust denial, uh, which is a contemporary phenomenon, but I'm writing about history, about how anti-Semites shaped history, uh, what they did in history, et cetera. When I was writing about uh, contemporary anti-Semitism, not only was I writing about the present, but I was also writing about the future. Um, so that made it hard. And, and then in the introduction, so I talk about that in the introduction, and then I go on to say, and of course the introduction is the last thing you write, right before sending off. It was a hard book to write, it was an even harder book to finish because every day there seemed to be something that needed to be added. Revelations about the Labour Party in England and Jeremy Corbyn's going to uh, Tunis and, and being part of a commemorative cel um, a ceremony at the grave of one of the people who committed the, or at the, the memorial site for one of the people who committed the Munich massacre. Uh, the Polish Holocaust law, the revision of the Polish Holocaust law, uh, Viktor Orban, Hungarian prime minister's attack on George Soros. Uh, over and over, there were things that needed to be added. And finally, about uh, a day or two after Labor Day, uh, my editor called me and said, Deborah, if we're going to get it out at the due day, at the date it's supposed to be published, in, end of January, beginning of February, we need it now to do copy editing, et cetera, because that, that the process is, still has a lot of steps in it. Um, and so right before I hit send, I added the following paragraph. I said, I'm a historian, and usually, and that means that I deal with what was and not with what is, and certainly not with what will be, but I'm willing to take a chance and say that by the time this book appears, something will have happened that should have been included. And of course, six weeks later came Pittsburgh, and now six months later came the San Diego shooting. So uh, I too would like to be less relevant. Um, I think one of the things that's so hard for people to understand, and I think many Jews sort of uh, parroting or uh, reiterating what Justice Potter Stewart sa said in, in his decision on Louis Malle's, uh, uh, one of Louis Malle's movie, whether it was pornographic or not, and probably what is the most famous line to ever come out of the Supreme Court, he wrote in his decision, uh, I can't define pornography, but I know it when I see it. And for many Jews, that's similarly the case with anti-Semitism. They may not be able to give you a definition, but they know it when they see it. However, in the case of anti-Semitism, I think it's really possible to get a much more uh, exacting definition. Not maybe a precise, and it's, it's a changeable, and it will morph, but, but we know certain elements. And I would say that there are three, maybe four elements that are, that are central to virtually every anti-Semitic charge. One is money. Second is intellect, smarts, but nefarious smarts, malicious smarts, smarts used in an evil way. And the third is power, an inordinate amount of power, power that extends beyond their number or beyond what one would think uh, Jews would have by virtue of their place in society, but power. And those th th three things combine together with yet another element, and that is a, 
a, a, demon, a demonization. And when I say demonization, I, I'm thinking of the demon in terms of sort of the, the way Christianity looks considered the demon. The demon was someone who could change forms. You couldn't recognize the demon until the demon had done his work. And the demon was the only one powerful enough to possibly harm God. And the Jew became that demon, you know, poisoning the wells, desecrating the host, blood libels. Uh, and, and the Jew knew that Jesus was the true God, but they, they wouldn't accept it. And that's how it evolves in Christianity. It moves on, and I'm going to talk about how it morphs. But where, what is the source for that? Um, the source for that, of course, is the story of, in the New Testament of the death of Jesus, the crucifixion of Jesus. Uh, the way the story is told and the way the story was told for millennia afterwards uh, was that the Jews killed Jesus. Of course, everybody in the story is Jewish except for the Romans who actually kill him, but that's a historical detail that shouldn't con doesn't concern the anti-Semite. The Jews wanted Jesus killed, why? Because he wanted to chase the money changers out of the temple. He felt that the presence of the money changers desecrated the kedusha, the holiness of the temple, and also that they were cheating people. And that members of the Sanhedrin and the uh, high priests and the priests did not want that to happen because that would limit their power. They were benefiting from having those, them financially benefiting from having those money changers there. So they went to the Romans and got the Romans to agree to kill him. The Romans didn't want to do it. And the Jews cry, crucify him, crucify him. And the Romans changed their mind. Now that's where you get that element of power. They're, they're, the intellect comes in their ability to devise this plan and the power because who was Rome at that time? Rome was the most powerful entity in the world and yet they were able to get the Romans to change. Now the, the unique aspect I think of anti-Semitism as a form of prejudice, because it is a form of prejudice along with many other prejudices, is not only this, this uh, these long roots, the idea that anti-Semitism is the oldest or the longest hatred, as Robert Wistrick, uh, the late Robert Wistrick, the historian, termed it, but its ability to morph so that you have the anti-Semitism of the church from the uh, early medieval through the, the, throughout the medieval period and into the, the modern period even, um, but then it moves. It, it migrates. It migrates, take a, a Voltaire in the 17th century. Voltaire, an absolute critic of the power of the church, but when he writes, he's writing overtly anti-Semitic things, we write about the Jews, overtly anti-Semitic things that sound that they come out just out of a, a, uh, a, a medieval uh, uh, church father or go further, go into Karl Marx, an opponent of religion, excoriating religious beliefs, and yet his depiction of the Jews comes right out of the template that I described for you. Or you go to uh, the pseudoscience of eugenics, and there the writing, uh, Houston Stewart Chamberlain and others who, who are very much, their work is adopted and adapted by the National Socialists, by the Nazis. Again, writing about the Jew in the same fashion. So you have this, this ubiquitous nature of anti-Semitism where it migrates from the right to the left and back again. And in fact, I, you know, there's a debate going on now that has reached Congress and commentators. You know, what is worse, anti-Semitism from the right or from the left? And I say it really doesn't make a difference but because they, they sort of meet in the middle. Uh, when David Duke, the former head of the Ku Klux Klan, is uh, liking and retweeting tweets of Representative Omar, you know that the right has met the left. Um, but but that but that in a moment. Um, so so it, it has this ubiquit this age old, this ubiquitous quality that makes it morphable. It can morph from traditional um, church religious sources to communist to eugenics etc. Um, 
And it has a conspiracy theory element, again, using those characteristics that I described right at the beginning, which aren't present in other prejudices. So the conspiracy theory, the idea that the Jews, like the demon, you can't identify them, but they're behind things, they do things, they make things happen, they make things happen to the detriment of the non-Jew. Um, and that's why when uh, Viktor Orban, who I mentioned earlier, the Prime Minister of, uh, of Hungary, or even in this country or, or during the presidential campaign, the final ad of the Trump campaign, features a George Soros. Now, they, actually the final ad of the Trump campaign, which I, I doubt that the president, uh, then the candidate, had much to do with, but, his, but his, somebody in his um, orbit produced it, showed four people, Hillary Clinton, naturally, that was his opponent, and three others, Janet Yellen, Lloyd Blankfein, then the head of Goldman Sachs, and George Soros, all Jews. And, and what was Soros doing there? Because Soros is depicted, Soros is sort of like the Rothschild of the 21st century. You don't quite know where he's having his influence, what he's doing, but he's there, he's, he's making his, his evil deeds, uh, uh, he's accomplishing his evil deeds. So it's all part of a, um, a continuum. It's not something new, it's not something uh, different. Um, on top of which, I think another characteristic of anti-Semitism is, is not only its delusional nature, uh, where you, but it's, Self-contradiction. Amongst the charges made against Jews, of course, as with uh, Soros, that they're, they're all capitalists. They're the, they control the banks. They control everything behind the scenes. But at the same time, you will find charges that the Jews are communists. They're, they're revolutionaries. Or the Jews are clannish. They stick together. They separate themselves from others. And at the same time, you get the charge, Jews are pushy and always want to be part of place, in places where they're not wanted. That was what gave rise to the famous line from Groucho Marx, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be part of, I wouldn't be a member of any club that would have me as a member. Uh, and that was said when in LA there were these country clubs which wouldn't allow Jews to join. Um, but, but you can't be a capitalist and a communist, you can't be pushy and clannish at the same time. But that's part of the fabric of anti-Semitic uh, charges. So you have this delusional uh, quality, this delusional idea about the Jew and the power of the Jew and the ability of the Jew to wreak havoc with the non-Jews for their own benefit. And they will do this without any concern about uh, borders or national dividing lines, and that's where you get the conspiracy, the, the uh, dual loyalty charge, that Jews care more about one another than they do about the country in which they live. Now, as I said earlier, um, anti-Semitism is a prejudice like other prejudices, racism, homophobia, misogyny, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And as a prejudice, if you think about the etymology, we're in a high school where there's got to be, well, now it's May, so they're finished with standardized tests, but soon enough that cycle will begin and they all study etymologies. If you think about the etymology of the word prejudice, prejudge. Don't confuse me with the facts. I've made up my mind. Uh, a colleague of mine likes to say that you meet the stereotype of the person face to face when the person themselves, or himself or herself, is still two blocks away. So you see an African American, you know who they are and what they are because they're African American. Uh, you see uh, you know, a Jew, you know who they are and what they are because they are a Jew. Or you see a pretty young blonde student, you know what she is and who she is because she's a pretty young blonde uh, student. It's all form of prejudice, but only in the, and, and, and dangerous prejudices. But only in the case of anti-Semitism do you have this appended to it, this morphable quality, as I like to call it, and uh, this conspiracy element, and these long roots, uh, right and left. 
Um, I think that, that it's also important to understand, because there's, there's a lot of talk now and attention, and rightfully so, to the nature of prejudice and what, what, where does, how does prejudice operate? And there are many people who argue, particularly on the progressive left, and I'm an equal opportunity critic here, I will go back and forth, um, that the, um, particularly on the progressive left, that, uh, or when they look at Jews, this is, this is very much what we see in the uh, British Labor Party, not only in the British Labor Party, certainly not only there, but, but it's so clearly articulated there, that the leadership of the, the Labor Party, those around Jeremy Corbyn, their view of prejudice is refracted through a prism Remember, a prism bends light, it shapes your, your, your perspective, that has two facets. One facet is uh, ethnicity, and the other facet is class or privilege. And they look at Jews and they say, oh, you are white, even though on the right, they, the right, the far right, the guy in, in Poway synagogue, the shooter in Pittsburgh, and, and lots of others, don't consider the Jews white. I mean, what was the, the guy in Pittsburgh crying as he was brought down by the SWAT team? You won't destroy the white race to the Jews. You know, the Jews, you won't. So to them, the Jews are not white. But to the, the progressive left, they look at the Jew as white and as privileged. Ipso facto, having power, and therefore, unable, it's impossible for them to be a victim of prejudice. Um, and so when Jews cry that this is anti-Semitism or say, you know, I'm a vict I've, I've been a victim of prejudice, this can't be real. This can't be legitimate. It must be a cover for something else. And we see that repeatedly, again, not just in the Labor Party, we see that on the progressive left. Not all people on the progressive left, but we see it a lot on the progressive left. Uh, you must be covering for something else. This must be about Israel, even if the thing has nothing to do with Israel, uh, that that charge is made. Um, at the same time, um, I think it's also important to recognize that anti-Semitism as a prejudice presents differently, again, because this issue of seeming power, than, let's say, racism, particularly racism, to, uh, racism towards African Americans or Latinos, et cetera. Um, and I talk in the book about um, having been present once at a home of friends of mine. It was a Friday night dinner, and everybody was sort of gathered around in the kitchen before uh, you know, the family was making the final preparations. It's a big, comfortable kitchen. So we were just, everyone was standing there, just sort of schmoozing and um, chatting. And um, when uh, I, I happened to be privy to a conversation of a mother and her teenage son. He's a high school junior or senior, recently got his license. And the mother was berating him for having come home so late from a party the night before. It was in a dicey area of town where there had been some uh, criminal acts and she had been nervous, et cetera. And her son was trying to reassure her. And he said, Mom, you don't get it. We left the party in a group. Four of us guys walked together. We walked to the car together. As we walked to the car, a policeman who was patrolling the neighborhood saw us and followed us in his car. And then once we got into the car, he followed us till we were out of that neighborhood and safely on the highway. And he was trying to reassure his mother. But had he been an African-American young man, that wouldn't have been a reassuring moment even if the policeman had no evil intentions and no bad intentions, but just the perception. So things present differently, and I think we have to recognize that, but still it is, uh, you know, it is a prejudice, but, but a prejudice that doesn't look like the other prejudices that people so often talk about. Um, one of the uh, aspects, I think, of uh, anti-Semitism that has so confounded us in recent years, confounded historians, confounded people who write about it, and certainly confounded members of the Jewish community, but not only members of the Jewish community, is the conflation with Israel. 
Um, and there will be those who will argue that, uh, you know, I can't criticize Israel because I will be accused of being anti-Semitic. Now, I don't, I know very few people who immediately assume any criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic, but there are those who might, who do. And that's, I mean, it's a, it's a silly notion. If you want to read criticism of Israel, you just read Haaretz every day, you know, the Israeli newspaper, or better yet, because some dismiss Haaretz as, you know, Haaretz is so far to the left, but you go to the Knesset, and when they stop screeching at each other, um, and if you can understand the Hebrew, you'll see this real severe and, and direct criticism of Israeli policies. Criticism of Israeli policies is not anti-Semitism. And people have to be very careful. If you're gonna make the charge of anti-Semitism, it's a serious charge. You gotta make sure that, that it's really true because if you, if, you, if you accuse someone and it's not true or it's inaccurate, you, you, you want, not only next time you, you make the accusation, people won't pay attention, but also it's, it's a terrible charge to put on someone if it's not the case. However, going back to the Israeli policies, what I would argue um, is that when there is a myopic focus on Israel, uh, a myopic focus, a focus on Israel to the exclusion of all other human rights abuses in the world, so that you don't even notice them, you don't even aren't even aware of them. Um, the terrible persecution of Muslims in China, uh, millions, millions, or the genocide of the Rohingya in Myanmar. Um, or in so many other places, the treatment of dissidents in Saudi Arabia. Now, I don't think Israel wants, on a human rights level, would want to be in the same category as a, even a China, Myanmar, or Saudi Arabia. But nonetheless, for the um, person who is the human rights activist, who only sees one problem to the exclusion of all others, and who sees all the fault on one side, it's true, one side is more powerful, one side has much more power to act, but still sees all the problem, the fault on one side. You have to ask, what's going on here? Is this a true estimation of what's going on? Is this a true analysis of what's going on? Or is there something else that even unconsciously may be driving it? Uh, the other thing I think that is that you often hear, and I read a lot of these websites, you know, for my sins, I, I, I spend a lot of time on these on various and sundry websites that are not friendly towards towards Jews. But sometimes you will also hear um, the claim made that Israel was founded in uh, a, an, an ultimate act of injustice, the expulsion of the Palestinian Arabs during the War of Independence. And it is true that there were cities and villages and areas in what became Israel in which is Jewish forces did chase the uh, Palestinian Arab residents out. That's been documented. It's been documented extensively and repeatedly. But it's also true that many of the Palestinian Arabs who left the area left because they were urged to do so by the leaders, by the Arab radio, you know, leave now and when you come back, you will get the Jews gardens and village and homes and businesses, et cetera, et cetera. And I have had people say to me, well, you know, Israel was founded in sin. If you chase people out, that, that, that delegitimizes your right or you oppress the people who are there, uh, you, you, that delegitimizes your right to be a country. And, and I, my response to that is always, let's put that in a historical context. Uh, let's think of other countries which might have done similar things and start, start with the United States of America. Which, no, no, it's not a joke. It's, and it should be something we're profoundly embarrassed by. Our treatment of the Native Americans. It's, it's a shame. Or slavery. Slavery. I mean, much of this country, I live in the South, much of the wealth of the South was built on the backs of slaves. And who were, even after the, the freedom, were, were oppressed nonetheless. Or think about Canada and its treatment of, I think, what is called in Canada, the First Nation. 
indigenous peoples who were forced into schools in the most, the children forced into schools, residential schools, in the most horrific circumstances. Or think about Australia and the treatment of the Aborigines. Or New Zealand and the treatment of the Maoris, which was a little better than the treatment of the Aborigines, but wasn't great. So in other words, again, there, there are faults. No country is free of faults. No country is free of wrongdoings. But the question is, when you have that myopic focus, um, what is going on? And there's some people who equate being opposed to Zionism, being opposed to the existence of the Jewish state, as a form of anti-Semitism. There, I think it's historically more nuanced. It's historically more nuanced because uh, first of all, there are Jews today who are opposed to the existence of the Jewish state. Ask a Satmer Hasid if they'll talk to you. Um, yeah, they are virulently opposed to the existence of a Jewish state. But even uh, going back, let's say go back to pre-48, pre-47, 48, there were many Jews who were very much opposed, thought an idea of a Jewish state was a mistaken idea. I wouldn't label all those people as anti-Semites. I think that's just wrong. But I think if you take it into the reality of today, and you look at two different things. First of all, you look at the rhetoric of many of those who are opposed to the existence of the State of Israel. And it's a rhetoric that is redundant. It, 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 it emanates, it's fragrant in, in a very uh, a not pleasant way with anti-Semitic tropes and anti-Semitic memes. It's just there. Uh, number one. Number two, the state now exists. It exists, I think the population is 7 million, with 6 million Jews. Um, where are those people supposed to go? The late Helen Thomas, the reporter, was quoted once as saying, oh, let them all go back to Poland. Well, the fact is that over 50% of the population of Israel are people of color, would be considered people of color. Yemenites, Middle Eastern Jews, many of whom, of course, were expelled as well. Um, Ethiopians, et cetera, et cetera. So these, I'm, I'm not trying to get into the weeds of the Middle East situation. All I'm trying to say is when I look at someone whose analysis and whose perspective of the situation is so out of whack, I have to wonder what is going on here. Is it hiding an anti-Semitism or are they, maybe even unconsciously so, using anti-Semitism in their critique? Um, and I think that that is a, a major part of the issue. On the campus, of course, we now see things like BDS, boycott, divest, sanction. And by the way, I don't think boycott, divest, sanction. I don't think everyone who supports it is ipso facto an anti-Semite. I think they're kids who support it who probably couldn't find Israel on a map. Um, it's hard, you know, it's very little, uh, but if you're, going to, if you're going to be critical, you should be able to find it. Um, but I think if you look at the find, founding documents of the BDS movement, or you listen to the people who, who created the movement, then you hear there a, uh, a real opposition to the existence of a Jewish state, um, a desire for a destruction of the Jewish state, and often made in overtly um, anti-Semitic language. And sometimes these groups will slip into it almost inadvertently. At Emory, uh, where I teach, um, we recently had an, an incident, which has happened on many campuses, with a, a pro-Palestinian group um, uh, uh, putting eviction notices under students' doors in a whole dorm, not just Jewish students, all the students. And the language was the language very much of, that's used when Israel evicts a, uh, a Palestinian, the family of a Palestinian terrorist, and they very often blow up the house or, or whatever. Um, of course, that wasn't mentioned there, but then it talked about ethnic cleansing, and it talked about Judaization, so it really went over the line from criticism of Israeli policies to linking it to Jews. And the group that did it when they were criticized uh, called for a boycott in response to all pro-Israel groups, but in their list of, their, we should boycott this group, you know, Emory Students for Israel and this group, and we should boycott all activities of Hillel and Chabad. Now those, they may have, pro-Israel activities as part of some of their programs, but those are Jewish programs. That was anti-Semitism. You know, the minute you cross that, and they did it just 
un unapologetically, and when they saw they were getting some criticism, they tried to back down from it, but it was a little, a little late for that. Um, but but the the attitudes towards Israel and that, and believe me that I think um, this is, is and I want to go back to a point I said earlier that criticism of Israel and criticism of Israeli policies and criticisms of the government of Israel is not anti-Semitism and in fact I would argue also that some of the policy decisions made by the state of Israel and the government of Israel in in recent years have have made that argument harder to make it, it's it's some of them have not been particularly um, efficacious, but um, it's very important to keep those things uh, separate. Um, the last thing I want to touch on um, before we, we open up to questions in a few minutes is the impact of anti-Semitism on Jews. Um, and before I, let me hold off on that just for a minute, um, because I mentioned two things, I think uh, the sources of anti-Semitism in the right and on the left, and my argument is that they meet. They meet, I had a professor in graduate school, uh, Ben Halpern, a modern Jewish historian, who used to say that was the one thing they, that, that both the right and the left agreed on. What we're seeing today is it's coming simultaneously from the right and the left, and not just from the right and the left, there are two other sources. One is Islamist extremists, and that's particularly, we see that in places in the European continent where most of the attacks on uh, Jews, on houses of worship, Jewish um, uh, hyper kasher, the grocery, the supermarket or grocery store in, in France, et cetera, have been committed by Islamist extremists. And sadly, and this is also very disturbing, but from segments, and I want to be very careful here because I don't want to be misunderstood and I don't want to engage in the same labeling that I'm, I'm attacking, um, but segments of the European Muslim community, some of them new arrivals, refugees, new citizens, call it, call it what you may, um, people who would never think of doing anything violent towards a Jew, but who, and we've seen it in this country as well, but who just accept these anti-Semitic charges, Jews control the economy, Jews control the media, Jews control the banks, Jews have all the power, the White House responds to Jewish complaints, the administration of the university where my kids go if the Jewish parents yell immediately hops to it. This, this, uh, this integration, this, and, and, and again, these are people who would never consider doing anything harmful. In fact, uh, you know, some of them might even say my, my best friends are Jews. I, I remember when I uh, first heard that comment, I was quite young, and I was with my father in some store or something, and um, he, he said something about the synagogue we go to, or whatever he identified as, as Jews, and the um, store manager said, oh, Mr. Lipstadt, you should know that some of my best friends are Jews. And my father didn't say anything. We walked out and I said, that's really nice, Daddy, isn't it, that some of the best friends are Jews? And my father said to me, did you ever hear someone boast that some of their best friends were white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, you know? Uh, in other words, if you're boasting that some of these people are your best friends, first of all, you're saying, look how, look how great I am, look how liberal I am, look how open-minded I am. Some of these people are my best friends, and some of these people, I'm friendly with the good ones, but not with the rest of them. So that some of my people, whether it's Jews or people use it with African Americans, whatever it might be, is a disturbing thing. Now to my final point before we get to uh, uh, questions and answers Q&A. Um, is the impacts of anti-Semitism, I don't have to belabor with, with this audience, I'm sure you, you understand them and part of drove you to come and be here tonight. But I think there is one impact of anti-Semitism that scares me most of all. And it's not the shooter who goes into the synagogue, though I will go into a synagogue on Friday night and on Saturday where there will be a police car in front and a, an armed guard with a bulletproof vest, you know, and armed to the teeth uh, standing in front and there'll be members of the synagogue ostensibly there as welcomers, you know, sort of like Walmart has welcomers, we have welcomers, but really what they're there for, and everybody knows it though nobody says it, is to check who's coming in. And is this someone who looks suspicious or is not, you know, is not suspicious? Um, and I worry 
that of, of a number of things happening, of the, but particularly of the leitmotif of our, of, and I speak now as a Jew and not as the academic, I sort of taken off my mortarboard and put on my kippah, if you will, um, uh, that what Jews will do to themselves is either strengthen their Jewish identity because we're gonna show them. We're gonna show them that they can't put us down. And, and when you do that, you think of yourself as object. They wanna put me down, I won't let them. And that's how I identify. And what you do by that is you obliterate or you, you really lessen the importance and the centrality of all the positive things of Jewish identity. You forget what Jewish subject, what Jews do, and it's all about what is done to Jews. And the other thing I worry about, and this is particularly in the orbit uh, in which I move as some of the other people in the audience and on the college campus, of the Jewish student coming to campus and saying, I don't want to spend the next four years fighting. I don't want to spend the next four years being identified um, and, and having to be defensive or whatever. I still feel strongly about my Jewish identity, but I'm just not going to let that become uh, what these four years are about. And it's sort of like going underground. I'll go on a program to Israel, but I won't talk about it. I'll go on a trip to, with my parents to visit Jewish communities in different parts of the world, but I just won't talk about it. I won't identify as such. And becoming, once again, the Shah still Jews. And I think that that's a challenge we face, a very important challenge Jews face, is even as you fight this, um, to maintain the, the perspective, the balance of what is important uh, in terms of identifying as a Jew. And finally, to, for non-Jews, because this is not certainly not a concern just for, for Jews, not at all, the reason to fight anti-Semitism Yes, you know, some of your best friends may really be Jews. Maybe you're, uh, you have Jewish uh, relatives or you are a Jew. That's a good reason, but it's not sufficient. Maybe because you hate all forms of prejudice. It just terribly disturbs you. That's a good reason, but it's not sufficient. The ultimate reason to be so disturbed by this evolution, this growth, this expansion, this open willingness to express anti-Semitism is no healthy democratic society has ever existed and tolerated uh, anti-Semitism in its midst. There's anti-Semitism in its midst. First of all, it starts with the Jews, it may never end, it never ends with the Jews. But more importantly, there is a belief about conspiracies, there is a belief, a, a prejudice that has invaded the fabric of the society and can lead to no good. Um, I think we stand at a time, and with this I end, we stand at a time where anti-Semites, white supremacists, who of course are racist but are equally anti-Semitic, feel emboldened, those on the left, some on the left feel emboldened, and it's a time for all of us to stand up and become the unwelcome guests at the dinner party, to call people out. There's lots that the government must do in declaring this acts like Poway domestic terrorism, but there's also something we can do and not to tolerate even those little asides, those little jokes, those little comments, whether no matter what part of the uh, political spectrum they come from, uh, they are dangerous and they are a threat not just to the Jewish community and not just to Jews but, or other minorities, but they're a threat to the society which we so treasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deborah. So we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. If you would like the mic, please go ahead and raise your hand. Please do keep questions to just one question and no statements, please, just so that we can get to everybody. Um, let's start right over here. Hello. Um, I'd like you to comment a little bit about what's happening in the Congress with the Democratic Socialists, because part of their agenda is to deny the existence of Israel or more eloquently the way you described it. Okay, um, I think that there's some disturbing trends that we've seen among certain members of Congress. 
two or three in particular. There are a lot of others. There's been an inordinate amount of attention, but a disturbing amount of attention, um, a dis un or a intention on, dis on disturbing acts. Um, and I find it very, very troublesome. I've spoken out, I've written about it. Um, I don't think it's a trend right now for the entire Democratic Party. Um, but I, what I do fear is the potential, and if this happened, it would be a long way off, for a, uh, a laborization, you know, as, as in British Labor Party of the Democratic Party, because that will really leave Jews with, to my mind, very few options. Um, but right now, I think it's also a matter of seeing things in perspective. You have um, a couple of freshman members of Congress, uh, one of whom has, you know, tweets anti-Semitic things and then says she didn't know they were anti-Semitic. You know, at some point you have to, with apologies to the bard, say, me think the gentlewoman doth protest too much, you know. Um, but I think also keeping things in, in perspective. I've been talking about it for the past 45 minutes. Um, I think, you know, it, we'd have to, you'd have to be more specific about who exactly you're talking about, but again, um, probably don't have time for that. I think what you're seeing is that um, cosmopolitan humanism, um, and many of these people are Jews. What did uh, uh, some Israeli once said when he meets uh, students on a campus and they say, oh, I'm a humanist, he knows they're Jews, you know? Um, but um, I, I find it that same kind of refusal of, of ex I find it very disturbing. I find it very disturbing. The people you're speaking about um, in that, in that contradictory mode are, are self-contradictory, but they, of course, would be the first to deny it. We've got a question right over here. Um, I just read uh, the uh, article in the Washington Post which had pastors or priests um, acknowledging, especially from the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, mm -hmm. that there is still, um, in the New Testament, they're still blaming mm -hmm. Jews for killing Jesus, and this is current, and this feeds into the theology of white nationalists and provokes these acts. What mm -hmm. do you think, and what can we do about that? Well, I think, I mean, we're not going to change the New Testament. That's, that's not going to happen. There were people at one time who said those things. It's not going to happen. I think it's what, what we saw, and now this sounds like ancient history, uh, but of course Vatican II um, was, a, was a real attempt by the Catholic Church to address this. It made a lot of steps forward, and it's very significant steps forward. Um, but it, it hasn't gone, it ha the, that evolution hasn't gone far enough. And I think it's really calls for schools of theology that are training these priests and these ministers to say, look, we have this lodestone in our tradition, we have to address it. We have to address what, it, what its historical implications are and what its current implications are. Um, in terms of white supremacy, I think it's been hij that's been hijacked by the white supremacists. You know, the white supremacists, and I'm just bouncing off your question because I didn't mention this in the, in the um, body of my talk, uh, what's, what's motivating the white supremacist is uh, the theory of, uh, is a replacement theory. What do they mean by a replacement theory? What were those, in fact, what were those marchers in Charlottesville, what did they mean when they walked across the street, across the campus, chanting, Jews will not replace us? Um, they were not fine people. Fine people do not go to rallies <laughs> organized by the alt-right, by Richard Spencer, who is an overt racist and an overt anti-Semite. That's just not the case. Um, but what, what did they mean by Jews will not replace us? Well, they are motivated, and it, it does relate, in a sense, to, you, to your question about the New Testament sources. Um, they are motivated by a sense that the uh, white Christian, particularly the white Christian male, but white Christians in general, are facing a genocide. There is a worldwide genocide against white Christians. Um, and 
uh, you know, when they look around and they see an African American taking their job, or an African American being president of the United States, or head of a bank, or head of a corporation, or a Latino, or a woman, um, a non, especially a non non Christians, uh, the question comes: up, Well, how are they capable of doing this? These these people, quote unquote, I'm putting myself in the mind of the white supremacists. They're not capable of achieving these things on their own. Who is making this happen? Who is manipulating this? Who is acting behind the scenes? Not identifiable, but making this all happen. The Jew, the George Soros's. Supplementing those swarms, 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 whatever they were called, of people coming from the south to infest our country, uh, the immigrants, the refugees flooding through Europe. It's all being done by the Jews to create a white genocide, a genocide of white Christians, a genocide of white Christian culture. And we've seen that, that expression in this country a lot too uh, in, in the past three years, four years. It's been there earlier, but now people aren't afraid to express it. Two days ago, in for, three days ago, in front of Politics and Prose, the bookstore, bookstore that is a iconic bookstore in Washington, D.C., uh, inside a professor, an author, was giving a talk on white supremacy, et cetera, and white supremacists were marching outside proudly objecting to the talk. Now, they have freedom of speech to do that, but there was a time when people would be embarrassed, ashamed to openly express those views. That shame is gone. That's really dangerous. Yeah. Uh, could you comment about the cartoon from the international uh, um New York the, Times. Please. New York Times. The cartoon relied on overtly anti-Semitic tropes. Now, the ed there was an editor who apparently didn't notice that. Um, and if I take that as face value, that editor shouldn't be an editor choosing cartoons. You know, um, what I was, and I was deeply disturbed by it. I was very thankful for Brett Stevens' column on it, criticizing it. But I thought the New York Times editorial yesterday was amazing in acknowledging the wrongs of the paper. Now, the next day it published another cartoon, which I don't think was anti-Semitic, but was just stupid, um, with Netanyahu, et cetera, et cetera, and it, I, I think that wasn't smart at all. But um, I think their editorial statement was very, very powerful, not weaselly in the sense of, well, we didn't really know and we didn't really think, and, but recognizing its wrongs. Now, the question will, proof will, of the pudding will be in the eating, what, what follows in this? But that the cartoon was, was horrendous is, is no question about it. You've got a question right over here. Hi, you spoke a little bit about the environment on campus and um, in terms of the need for people to speak out for, for themselves against anti-Semitism. Could you please go into a little more detail about that? I have two kids, um, one entering high school, one in high school who will be uh, in college shortly. Mm -hmm. Um, I think, you know, that they're, they're, the mistake, I mean, it's too often now when, when Jewish parents or grandparents talk about the situation on campus, it's always, oh, the campus is a hotbed of anti-Semitism, Jewish kids aren't safe on campus, et cetera. It's not true. You can, there are many, many campuses and even campuses in which there's a lot of political activity where Jewish kids feel entirely safe and have a wonderful experience. Having said that, there is a growing expression of, and well-organized, hostility towards Israel. I don't mean just criticism, but um, hostility towards Israel. And some of it um, beggars the imagination. One group I know, one uh, Student Voices for Peace, which is a, a pro-Palestinian group, has made very strong connections with the LGBTQ community. Now, it makes no sense because I know of no Muslim country which is a good place for an LGBTQ person. Um, I invite you to go to Tel Aviv on the day of the Gay Pride Parade. You'll be amazed at you know, what goes on there. I mean, that happened to be in Tel Aviv a couple years ago when that happened, and I just was flabbergasted. At, so um, 
you know, I think that th there are difficult things going on, but there's also thriving Jewish life on campus, thriving Jewish studies program. I was introduced by a representative for one of the finest Jewish studies programs we have in, in the United States here at Northwestern, at Emory. Um, and, and people openly and unashamedly identifying. Um, so I don't think it, 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 we have to be careful about, you know, sending our kids off, you're going off to fight a fight, you're going off to, into the lion's den, into a nest of vipers, because the first thing they're gonna do is say, well, I don't wanna be in that nest. But I think also, um, preparing them for them, they will hear criticism that they might not have heard before. And I think it makes it very important for them to have an understanding of uh, the Middle Eastern situation, the Arab-Israeli situation, Arab -Palestinian, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian situation, with all its nuances and with all the things that gone wrong. Because some of the students I've met who have moved all the way over to uh, a very hostility towards Israel have been students who said, look, I never heard any of this stuff when I was growing up. And um, I sort of felt blindsided. So I think you know, that there's a nuance here that needs to be taught and needs to be recognized. But by and large, I would argue most Jewish students on, on American college campuses are having a wonderful, wonderful experience, and some of them are even learning something, so. We've got time for just one more question after our Q&A. Please join us in the gym that is right over there uh, for the book signing. We're gonna go right over there. Can you tell I went to Parker? I stand up. Uh-huh. In your book, and this is not meant to be a spoiler, you lowercase, and single word. You de anti sim You de-hyphenate. No, I don't hyphenate. You, you de-hyphenate. De-hyphenate. Right. Good, good word. Right. Thank you. Anti-Semitism, mm -hmm. and you describe its origin as being plain and simple Jew hatred. Right. It's very clear. Tonight, you refer to anti-Semites, so it, I can get it, but then I have to put on my pre-reading your book mm -hmm. hat for that. But I'm disturbed by Jew having become a pejorative okay. and okay. Jewish not. Right. Let me answer that. I have one minute to answer that. Um, first of all, I don't think Jew is pejorative. I am a Jew. Hello. I don't think it's a pejorative statement. I think if we accept it as a pejorative statement, we turn it into a pejorative statement. I, let me just give some background for those people who have not yet, uh, to quote Franz Rosenzweig, read my book. Um, uh, 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 that the origins of the word anti-Semite, sometimes you hear people saying, um, I can't be an anti-Semite because I'm a Semite. You know, it's against all Semites. The, the word was created by a man named Wilhelm Marr, a journalist in the late 19th century in Vienna, who was looking for, who, who thought Jews were responsible for all the wrongs afflicting society, the changes in the economy, the changes in the society, the culture, and he was looking for a word that was bigger than Judenhass, Jewish hatred. He wanted something that treated Jews as a nation, not just as a religion, so that even Jews who had abandoned the religion would still be included in this, um, in this group. And so he came up with the word antisemitismus, no hyphen, and it meant one thing and one thing only, Jew hatred. At one point, his, later he recanted. On his deathbed, he recanted. He said, no, it was all the result of the Industrial Revolution. It, was, it wasn't the fault of Jews, but the, the horse had already left the barn. It was too late. Um, but um, when, the, when his article was published in England, some printer thought anti-Semitism. Well, maybe in German it's one word, but in English it should have a hyphen. And the rest is history. Thank you very much.